Good morning, Grace. Good morning. Wonderful to be with you. What a honor. What a privilege to worship Jesus with you today. Now, is it going to look like this every Sunday? Oh, I hope so. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he deserves all of our praise. Thank you to Pastor Jason, Brother Jason, and all of this team. Are you not richly, richly blessed with the worship ministry here at Grace? It's tremendous. It's tremendous. Let me do a quick introduction, if I may, for the prettiest girl in the world, <laughs> Miss Cindy. Sweetheart, will you let them see your gorgeous face, please? Right there, Miss Cindy. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. I'm a blessed man indeed. We have three of the four Lewis children here today. Our oldest, Heather, would love to be with us, but she is a music teacher, a young, fresh music teacher in North Carolina, and she had some students make the honors chorus there. It's a big deal for them. And so they're singing in Central North Carolina today, and she needed to uh, be a teacher and be with her students. But she and Parker will certainly be up depending on what you say at the end of the service today. They will be here with us before long. But I would like to introduce to you our middle daughter, who is 18 and a freshman in college, Miss Holly, right here in blue. Hello, Holly. Our youngest daughter, Hannah, who is 13 and in eighth grade, right there. Go ahead, Miss Hannah. Thank you, baby. And then the only other dude in the Lewis house, surrounded by all these pretty women, uh, my namesake, Bobby Ray Lewis III, who is now 12. Very good. And if you haven't caught it yet, my name is Bobby, and I'm honored to be with you. But here's the deal. That's all I'm going to say about me. Take your copy of God's Word, open it up, click it, swipe it, head over to that wonderful, exciting book, the book of Numbers. <laughs> you probably didn't see that one coming, did you? The book of Numbers. It's going to be chapter 21, Numbers 21. I hope you've done your homework. You've had an opportunity to look into the Lewis family and to see who we are and what we're all about. We had a wonderful Q&A yesterday with a number of you. Thank you for being so kind, so gracious, and asking such excellent substantive questions to us yesterday. And so today, I believe you need to know, how does this Lewis guy handle the Word of God? What is he going to do with the Scripture? Because I believe the primary role of the pastor is to be a man of the Word and a man of prayer. And so, if that is what God has called me to do, we need to spend the bulk of our time in the Word of God looking at what the Lord would say to us. Before I read the text and set the context, I do want to give a hearty thank you to Dr. Tony Pointer and the pastor search team. They have worked hard and they have worked long. So, thank you to these men and women. Let me also say it has been such an honor and a joy to get to meet some of your pastors, all of your pastors, your entire team here and their wonderful wives. Cindy and I have enjoyed our time. We've been up a few times to meet with them and it has been such a thrill for us. Grace, you are a richly blessed people, and you have some men and women here who really love Jesus and want to serve him with all of their heart. So, yeah, thanks to your team. Now, what's happening here in Numbers 21? Let me give you the context, if I may, before we jump in. Forty years of wilderness wandering are coming to an end. You'll recall that Moses had led the people out of Egyptian slavery, and they have been wandering around, and this first generation of Israelites has passed away. So you have a second generation of younger Israelites that's making their final trek to the promised land. In chapter 20, just before the focal text today, you'll find that Moses brings forth water from a rock at Kadesh. But rather than doing it God's way, he does it 
his way. And unfortunately, he has a very high price to pay because God says, all right, Moses, you do it your way if you want to, buddy, but now you'll only see the promised land. You cannot enter therein. Now, after that, we find that actually Aaron, Moses' brother, the high priest, he dies, and the people of Israel mourn his death for some 30 days. You also need to know a side note. A king, the king of Edom, had said, hey, Israelites, you can't come through our land. You're going to have to go around our land. And so he kind of uh, put a detour in their path, if you will. And finally, you need to know that there was another king that came out, the king of Arad, and he was battling the Israelites. And so the people of God just stopped. They began to pray. They began to seek God's face. And God gave them a miraculous deliverance. So what you would expect in chapter 21 is you would expect the people of God to be celebrating. We have this tremendous, tremendous victory, but that's actually not what we see in the Word of God. I believe that as we go through this text today, you will see how much this story parallels the journey of grace. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word at this time? Numbers 21, picking up verse Four. The Bible says, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So... The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned, for we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Now pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent set it on a pole or a standard, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Thus, the title of the message today, Look and Live. Look and live. Would you pray with me, church? Father in heaven, this is a wonderful time, a holy day, but it's not any more special just because the Lewises are here. It is a special day because the Holy Spirit of the living God is in this place. He is at work. He is moving through the worship, moving through the word. It will not go forth and return void, but it will perfectly accomplish that for which it is sent. And so the cry of my heart today is that this message would go forth with power, with passion, with accuracy, with anointing, with a fresh move of your spirit among your people. And God, to those who already know and love Jesus, may we know and love him more. May we draw closer to him in these moments together. And for those who are unsure of where they stand with Jesus Christ today, I am praying that this day, November the 11th, 2018, will be their birthday. This will be the day that they will be born again, turning from sin and self, trusting Jesus and Jesus alone as Lord and Savior. Father, we see Christ in every page of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. So let us get a fresh glimpse of him today. And may all we think, say, and do in these moments point us to Jesus, in whose strong and precious name we pray. And God's people said, amen. 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 Be seated if you would. So our text this morning indicates five consequences when you begin to look at things your way rather than God's way. Five consequences. So now, just excuse me, ladies, but I'll use the generic for just man or mankind. So what happens when we look at things man's way versus God's way? When we begin to look at things God's way, we begin to see things differently. But unfortunately, 
The people of God turn their eyes from the Lord. They turn their eyes from God's man, and they begin to look at their circumstances through their own humanistic lens. So if you have a note sheet, a bulletin, a napkin, get out a pen, lipstick, mascara, whatever you got, take some notes, all right? The dullest pencil is better than the sharpest mind. So write it down. Here we go. Number one, man's way brings discouragement. I want you to see this in the text. Man's way brings discouragement. Look with me again at verse 4. The Bible says, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. Why? Because the king of Edom said, hey, you can't pass through my land. Too many of you. You'll take our resources, and and you can't ravage the land. Although Moses and the gang said, hey, we'll just go straight down the road. We won't touch a thing. We won't take a thing. But he said, no. But rather than stopping and rather than praying to God, as they had done earlier in chapter 21 when the king of Arad came out to battle them, the people stopped trusting God, and the people became discouraged. Verse 4 says, the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Now, what's going on? Well, they were supposed to be heading north to the promised land, but now they're in this sort of circuitous route to go around the land of Edom. In other words, they were on a detour. You ever been discouraged when you felt like God put you on a detour? Hello. You ever felt like you didn't see that one coming? Hey, this was the path we were supposed to be walking down, Lord. This was the way we were supposed to be going. We didn't see that turn in the road. And the Bible says the soul, the nefesh, the innermost being of the people became discouraged along the way. The Hebrew word for discouraged means impatient, short. The people became impatient because things weren't happening as fast as they thought they ought to happen. Now, I know you are a holy people of God. You would have never questioned your pastor search team. What are y'all doing? (laughs) What's taking so long? You would have never, ever become discouraged or impatient on the way, right? (laughs) Uh, Some of y'all in that little section right there looking at me awful holy. Y'all better straighten up (laughs) right now. I'm going to call it like I see it. We all get a little discouraged when things aren't happening as quickly as we think they ought to happen. Let me give you a story about our oldest, if I may, since she's not here and cannot defend herself. Miss Heather, she was only about five years old at the time. We were in one of my favorite stores, one of those big box stores. I believe it was Sam's Club. And you know what they put right in the front of those stores? They put all the electronic gizmos and gadgets. Well, back in that day, those flat TVs were not nearly as prevalent, and they were way too expensive. So I knew the Lewis family couldn't afford one. But when we walked in that day, I just wanted to kind of look at them and check them out. Out, you know, something I could see but not touch. And so I'm standing there, and Heather at about five begins to tug on my pant leg. And she said, hey, Daddy, Daddy, I'm ready to go. Now, I don't remember if we had bought her a little toy or what, but she just did not want to be in that store, and she definitely didn't want to be looking at those big TVs that she knew we would never have. And so I said, honey, it's fine. Just give Daddy a minute. I'm going to just check some of this stuff out. Well, she gave me about three seconds. And then she said, Daddy, Daddy, come on, Daddy, I want to go. And I said, okay, Heather, just calm down. And do your kids ever elongate their vowels when they really want something? Dad, Dad, I really want to go, Dad. And I said, Heather, come on. And finally, Cindy chimed in and said, now, Heather, look, just give your Daddy a minute. So Heather, five years old, right at the front of Sam's Club, crossed her little arms, stomped her foot, looked up at Cindy and said, Mama, do you know Daddy is just like Pharaoh? And I got to tell you, that got my attention. (laughs) And Cindy said, sweetheart, what do you you mean that, that daddy is like Pharaoh? And Heather said, well, he wouldn't let his people go either. That's pretty good. I I, I thought that, that kid has been listening in Sunday school. But, uh, hey, guess what, Grace? It's not just five-year-olds that get impatient, is it? Sometimes you don't get your way and you start whining to your father too. Dad, why did this happen? Hey, friend, God is sovereign. 
This day does not surprise God. Your schedule over the last couple of years did not surprise God. He was not wringing his hands on the throne going, oh no, whatever shall I do for Grace Baptist Church? God wasn't worried about it. I hope you've been trusting him in the journey. God has brought us into this divine intersection in his time and in his way, and I guarantee it's for his glory. So, I just want us to know that when we look at it our way rather than God's way, man's way brings discouragement. Not only that, number two, man's way brings dissension. Dissension. You see it there in the first part of verse 5. The Bible says the people spoke against God and against Moses, meaning they should have been talking to God, and in that day they would have been talking through Moses. Since Aaron was dead, Moses is now the mediator. You don't need that anymore, by the way. We'll talk about it at the end. But here's the point. They were turning from God and turning from God's man and talking about God and about God's man. You know, we would say in North Carolina, they forgot they were a turtle on a fence post. Y'all know that in Tennessee? You know that? What do you, what do you know for certain when you see a turtle on a fence post? Come on, they're smart. Hallelujah. So, he did not get there by himself. Somebody put him there. They were at the edge of the promised land, not because they were good enough or smart enough or just loved God enough. They were there because God had brought them there. Do you know there are churches out here today that are splitting because they can't agree on what color carpet to put down in the church? Now, to me, that kind of silliness and dissension has no place among the people of God. But the people of God are arguing, they are fussing and fighting. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.8, I want men and women to pray in every place, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without dissension. Dissension and discord has no place among the family of God. We need to be unified. Now, I don't mean that there needs to be uniformity and that we should be a bunch of little Christian puppets. No, man, I want us to look different and sound different and all of that stuff. You know, not everybody's my height. Not everybody can be 6'2", give or take six inches. Um, (laughs) Not everybody can be a guy like this who, you know, loves basketball and all but just has to watch it on TV. This is the deal. This is the deal. God wants unity, oneness among his people. And rather than speaking against God, let's speak with God, to God, speaking and listening. And, you know, sometimes folks are embarrassed to meet it, but maybe they harbor a little dissension in their heart against the Lord. Something didn't happen the way you thought it ought to. Something didn't happen in the time you thought it ought to. So maybe you harbor a little bit of that tension. Can I encourage you today? Take advice from that song in Frozen and just let it go, please. Let it go. Trust God. Turn from sin and self. Man's way will always bring discouragement and dissension, but you'll see this too. Man's way brings depression. Man's way brings depression. You see it in this whiny statement right tucked into the middle of verse 5. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Now, if you have ever read anything at all about the children of Israel, you will hear that phrase. Their mamas and their daddies said it. They are saying it. And if things don't change, their young'uns are going to say it. They just whine all the time. Now, what did God say? God said, I'm going to take you to a promised land, a good land, a a land flowing with milk and honey, a wonderful place where you're going to be able to spread out and enjoy, and I'm going to give it to you. But they are denying the promise of God, and they are saying, why, oh God? Why did you do this? Weren't there enough graves back there in Egypt for our folks? Why did you bring us here to die? Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression. It weighs the heart down, but a good word makes it glad. What did God say through the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, 6, and 7? I bet you guys know this. Be therefore anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Give it to the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, right? Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll do what for you, church? Direct your paths. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never put on you more than he can bear. And if you know Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you today. You are a child of the King. And you know what, friends? God is always going to be a very present help in time of trouble. 
The promises of God, tried and true. The promises of God, abundant. And yet, sometimes we find ourselves in the throes of depression. Now, hear my heart for a minute. I do believe there are times when there are physiological issues that cause depression. I do believe that times there may be chemical imbalances that require medical attention that cause depression. But I want you to hear me, and I want you to hear me well. There are a lot of people, even in the church of Jesus Christ, that are trying to fix spiritual problems, which is what they had, with physical remedies, and it won't work. Pills and prescriptions and heaven help us, Dr. Phil, they're not going to fix you, okay? you got to trust the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the great physician, Jesus Christ. Now, man's way brings discouragement, dissension, depression, but also, don't miss this. I missed this a long time, and then I, it just came to me one day, right here in the text. Man's way brings delusion. Delusion. You know what that is, delusion? That's substituting your opinion for the truth. That's when you think you see something, you think you know something, but it does not accord with reality. I believe in 2018, these United States of America, there are a lot of delusional folks running around. And right here, the people of God are delusional. Do you see it? Right there at the end of verse 5, what do they say? Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. You know what that means in Hebrew? I'm going to give it to you right here in Hebrew. There is no food and no water. That's exactly what it means. It means this. Food and water are non-existent. Oh, 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 and by the way, our soul loathes this worthless bread. Now, you see the delusion, right? Did they have water? Sure they did. I just told you about Moses bringing forth a ton of water out of the rock at Kadesh, previous chapter. They had plenty to drink, and quite frankly, they had plenty to eat. But our soul loathes. That word in Hebrew is strong, abhors, vehemently hates. Now listen to this, this worthless bread. Anybody know what bread they were talking about? Manna fallen from heaven that has sustained the people of God 40 years, and they call it worthless. Let me tell you what that means. The core of that root word in Hebrew means this. It's light bread. It's bread of no nutritional value. <laughs> Are you kidding me? This bread has no nutritional value, and yet it sustained your folks, and it has sustained you all these years. What have they done, church? Well, they have substituted their opinion for the truth. You know what it's like saying, Man, I'm starving. I got to get something to eat. Oh Lord, I'm so hungry. Would you please give me a prime rib and a sweet tea? Oh Lord Jesus, please. I'm hungry. And God says, yes, my child, here's bread and water. And you say, I don't want your stinking bread and water. And God says, well, you weren't that hungry then, weren't you? You just weren't that hungry. See, the people of God are whining, and in their whining, they have become delusional. Now, I know I'm going to be treading on very, very thin ice, and I probably should have run this one by my sweetheart before I tell you, but I'm going to do it anyway. Sweet ladies, dear ladies, wonderful ladies, I have a lot of ladies in the Lewis home. It was me and four others for a long time. I finally broke down and got a little boy dog. I couldn't help it. I had to have something. <laughs> before we had Bobby. But you ladies, I've just never seen a fella do this, but you ladies now, I, 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 I got to admit, I've seen some delusional declarations coming from y'all. What do I mean? Well, with these girls here, I have seen at times, uh, you know, a trip to the closet. And you begin to peruse all of these different things, blouses and dresses and pants and shoes of all varieties and heights and purses and all of this stuff. And you just look through this wide array. I mean, it looks like you're looking over a department store. But I've seen the expression on these beautiful female faces change. And they fold their arms and they get a scowl on their face. And they look real harsh like this. And they make a delusional declaration. I have nothing to wear. I have never in my life seen a dude do that. 
I'll be in hunting camp in Iowa in a few weeks. I guarantee you none of my boys will come up and say, well, Bobby, man, I'd love to go out with y'all at the tree stand this morning, dude, but I just ain't got nothing to wear. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. What do we do? Hey, fellas, what do we do? We find it in the corner. It's balled up. We pick it up. We smell it. If we don't pass out, we put it on and go on. I love you. I'm sorry. I love you. You're the greatest. (laughs) Taking our opinion and substituting it for the truth. Well, God, God must not love me anymore. Hello. God, you must not be hearing our prayers over here at Grace. God, you were so faithful to us for all those years. God, why have you taken your hand off of us? Delusional. Completely delusional. Friend, you will never lose the love of God for you. As long as you preach and teach Jesus and keep him as the head of this church, because he always has been and always will be, regardless of who stands here, as long as you do that, the hand of God will always be on this place too. Don't be delusional. Don't substitute your opinion for the truth. Man's way brings discouragement, dissension, depression, delusion, but of course far more tragic than all of that put together. Man's way brings death. You see it, right? You see it. Verse 6. So, therefore, because of their response, the Bible says the Lord, Yahweh, sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, And many of the people of Israel died. Mm, mm -mm. Pastor Bobby, you really believe that? You really believe God sent some kind of poisonous, venomous snakes among the people? Yes, sir, I do, because that's what the Word of God says. I absolutely do. And let me tell you why. Because God takes sin seriously. In fact, sin is deadly serious. Do you remember what God told Adam? Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. He said, Adam... I'm going to let you eat of all of these beautiful trees here in this garden, but I want you to stay away from that one over there in the middle. He said, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you'll take from that tree in the day you eat of it, it's the strongest idiom in Hebrew, you will indeed, surely, truly die. For the wages of sin is death. Sin has always brought death because death is separation. Death is not extinction, by the way, for people. It is separation of body and soul. But that's another sermon for another day. The reality here is the people of God are sinning, speaking against God, speaking against his man. So the Lord sent fiery serpents. The word fiery is a Hebrew word I bet you've heard, seraphim. Fiery serpents. Why that descriptor? Well, I think twofold. Probably these were Egyptian cobras. Likely they had a brownish orange color, and as they slithered along the ground, they sort of looked like a flame going through that desert soil. Also, secondarily, wherever you were bitten, at the place that you were envenomated, that would feel as though your flesh were engulfed in flame. And it would follow your circulatory system all the way to your core being and to your vital organs till you would die a horrible, painful death where you could no longer breathe, engulfed in the flame of the venom. And God, according to the Bible, because God takes sin seriously, God sent the fiery serpents. Now, how did the people respond to that? Did they say, hey, Moses... Moses, we still hate this old bread. Moses, we still want some better water. Mm -mm. (laughs) You know when major tragedy strikes in you or your family, it'll change your prayers. It'll change your priorities. It'll change the way you look to God and start to trust God. And that's exactly what happened. The people would eventually go back to Moses. They're no longer talking against him. They're no longer complaining about the little things. That's what happens. My girls, they, uh, it was just Heather and Holly at the time, but there was a terrible ice storm when we were still living in North Carolina back a number of years ago. And in central North Carolina, the ice swept through very, very quickly, which we find is always worse than the snow. And Cindy called me. I'll never forget it because in my prayer journal that morning, I had just written, God, please keep my girls safe. She had just taken them across town to drop them off at daycare. We didn't realize it was sweeping in like that. She had to turn right around, and she was getting them. And I said, Lord, please keep them safe. Not even half an hour later, the phone rings, and it's Cindy crying. She says, honey, we've been in a really bad accident. 
a girl had come across the center line, clocked them head on. Of course, you know the first thing I want to know, right? How's the minivan? No, 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 no. Y'all think, what? No. No, Pastor Todd. He's like, I got to do counseling. No, 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 no. <laughs> How are you? How are the girls, right? That's all you care about. Do I care about the metal and rubber and plastic of that stinking minivan? Man, that does not matter. That stuff is replaceable. These are not replaceable to me. These are precious jewels to me. I'll do anything to protect them. You see, when, when tragedy strikes, your prayers change. <laughs> what did old Peter do? You remember old Peter when he was outside the boat and he took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink? What did old Peter do? He didn't say, oh, thou great God of heaven and earth, would thou come down and bless me and help me out? No, he said, Lord, save me. <laughs> That's all he could say. Lord, save me. And the people here, they just need an anecdote for death. They're dying. Their children are dying. Their mamas and daddies are dying. Because man's way always brings death. It brings discouragement, dissension, depression, delusion, death. But I really didn't come to talk about that. Sometimes you don't know how good the good news is until you know how bad the bad news is. This is the case for us all when we try to go through life our way. But Grace Baptist Church, would you hear me and hear me well today? God's way, God's way brings deliverance. Deliverance, freedom, liberty, salvation. This is what I want you to see. This is what I want you to remember. The Bible says, therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. You know, confession is good for you. They begin to confess. We begin to see the beginning of repentance here, just the front edge of repentance. They say, we have spoken against the Lord and against you, Moses. Now, please pray to the Lord for us, because again, Moses was acting at this time as a temporary mediator. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So what does Moses do? Well, thankfully, church, the Bible says Moses prayed for the people. I don't know what I would have done. I'm going to be very honest with you. I would have had a hard time. These are the same people that are whining and complaining to him just a little while before. But instead of saying, oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to pray for y'all. Y'all are talking smack about me. I'm not praying for y'all. Moses, with the mark of godly leadership, says, okay, I'll pray for you. I'll go to God on your behalf. I'll seek God's face. And, of course, what does God tell him to do? The Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent. Man, that is a weird plan. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, y'all, but that just strikes me really funny. The people say, hey, Moses, can you ask God to take away all the snakes from us? Moses prays, and God says, all right, Moses, make one more. Take some bronze, fashion a snake, put it on a standard, on a big old pole in the midst of the camp. And what does the Bible say? Everyone who is bitten, what's it say, church? When he looks at it shall live. Y'all see where the title comes from, right? Look and live. Very simple. Now notice this time Moses does not do it his way and Moses does not argue with God. I've got to be honest with you. If I'm the guy that gets that instruction from the Lord, I'm going to probably say, Lord, can you repeat that? Um, did, did you just say, make another snake? Th th these people are dying over here. They're going to kill me. Do you notice God does not stutter? God does not change the plan. There is one way. If people want to live, they've got to take plan a. There is no plan B. All the people have to do is look. Now, listen, we know how they're looking. Clearly, they're looking by faith. Clearly, they're not looking by medical science or some kind of proven voodoo. Nobody's ever heard of anybody being bit by an Egyptian cobra and surviving by looking at a bronze snake up on a pole. Nobody's ever seen such a thing. And yet, God told Moses very clearly, if they'll just look by faith, they will live. Maybe you've heard of the great prince of preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. 
His testimony is that he was sitting in church and he heard this one verse from Isaiah 45, 22. It's the Lord speaking. The Lord said this, Look to me and be saved, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. And when Charles Haddon Spurgeon heard that, his testimony goes that he knew he had to look to the Lord. He had to look specifically to Jesus Christ and he would be saved. And he in his lifetime would lead many tens of thousands to trust Christ as Lord and Savior. Church, I want to remind you of something. We have all been envenomated by sin. We've all been born as sinners. What is that? What is sin? Define that for me, Bobby. Sure. Sin is anything you think, say, or do, or maybe even that which you don't do that displeases God. It can be via commission, action, or lack of action, omission. Anything that displeases God. And the Bible says all. A-L-L, that means all. Every single one of us in this room has sinned. You say, well, how do you know that? Listen, I've had four kids. I never had, sorry guys, I never had to teach my kids how to tell a story. Ever. I mean, true, they hung out with a lot of deacons' kids, and that'll corrupt anybody, right? But look, look, here's the thing. Sorry guys, I love you. Here's the thing. You don't teach your kids to be disobedient. You don't teach your kids to to tell stories and all of that. They're just built that way. Because in Adam all die. In Adam all receive a sin nature. The only one that's ever walked this earth without that nature was not in Adam. He was a product of the Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the perfect God-man. Speaking of Jesus Christ, did you know Jesus is all over this story? Mm, He is all over it. You say, no, yeah. How many of you guys know, by heart, John 3, 16? Can we say that? I bet you know it. Ready? I'll I'll, kind of go old school King James. Ready? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Man, what truth is that? But now look, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not one of those pastors that tries to embarrass or manipulate in any way. So just in your heart of hearts. Now, let's just be honest. They're not going to put it on the screen just yet. So I want you just to be honest. How many of you truly know? Now, you know John 3.16. That was good. That was beautiful. You see it at the ball game. Go Vols. Y'all crushed it yesterday. Congratulations. Anyway, anyway. (laughs) Kentucky fans are like, oh, man, I can't believe he went there. Sorry, Bobby. Sorry, man. I heard. Uh, No worries. Look, here's the deal. How many of you truly, honestly, be honest, really know John 3, 14 and 15? Mm -hmm. Some of you little heathens are like, I have no idea. (laughs) I know you want to look it up real quick. You want to look it up so bad. Oh, what is it? What does it say? You know it's Jesus talking to Nicodemus, right? Nicodemus goes to him by night. He would become a secret Christ follower. No such thing in 2018, by the way. But he would become a secret Christ follower. And just before Jesus Christ would utter that most famous of verses, Jesus was right here in Numbers 21. Look at it with me, would you? It says this. And it's going to come up right now. There it is. Look at this, look at this, John 3, 14, 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. Did y'all see that? Now, I got to tell you, I've heard some preachers through the years do stuff like this. That means lift high the banner of Jesus. Praise God, we preach Christ and him crucified. And that's wonderful and that's true, but that's not what Jesus meant. When Jesus was saying this to Nicodemus, you know what he was saying? He said, hey, Nick, let me tell you what's about to happen. You see, the people disobeyed God, so God judged them because sin always brings death. And God had one plan through their leader named Moses, and that one plan was look at the serpent on the stick and live. 
He says, but I, the son of man, I too must be lifted up. Not on a wooden stick, but on an old rugged cross. And it'll be that any man, and any woman, and any boy, and any girl that would just look to me with the eyes of faith, if they will look, guess what, church? Mm, somebody's been listening. Thank you. They will live. You see, the formula is no different. What I'm asking you to do today is look to Jesus Christ alone and find life. Eternal, life abundant. Yeah. The bronze serpent was absolutely the one and only way that people could be saved in the wilderness. There is no plan B. You say, well, it doesn't really make sense. It's not up to you to figure out. It's up to you to obey, okay? It's not up to me to figure out the mind of God. It's up to me to obey the word of God. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus was very clear. What did he say, church? I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man, no woman, no boy, no girl comes to the Father but by me. One way. Now, you might think it's going to the right church, giving the right amount of money, being a good enough, smart enough, wealthy enough, good-looking enough person. But let me tell you right now, it's not enough. It won't get you one inch closer to God. The only way to enjoy eternal and abundant life is by grace through faith. You look to Jesus Christ. There is a way to conquer discouragement, dissension, depression, delusion. Yes, there is a way even to conquer death. Take God's deliverance. Look and live. Now, I'm going to close with an illustration. I heard a mentor of mine 20 years ago, actually, nearly 20 years ago, 19 years ago, I was early in ministry, and I heard him share something similar to this down in, actually in Florida in a pastor's conference, but I've taken it and tweaked it, and I, I'm just going to ask you to do something for me as we close out. I want you to use your imagination, okay? I want you just to kind of use your mind here, and I want you to see something. I want you to see, let's just say... I don't know, 14, 15 year old girl. I want you to see her first, all right? And I want you to see her running. I want you to see her tearing through the desert, seemingly oblivious, by the way, to all the snakes that are around her. And she's kind of weaving in and out of tents. I want you to see it. I want you to see her crying, the dust kicking up around those tears, leaving the tracks on her face. I want you to see her running over to maybe, let's say, her family's tent, and there is a gentleman older than her, and clearly he's been bitten. Clearly he's in agony. And I want you to hear her say, Daddy, it's going to be all right, Dad. Dad, Moses has prayed to God for us, Dad, and, and, and he's made this snake, and he's put it up on this big pole, Dad, and if you just turn over here, and, and if you just glance that way, Dad, it's going to be fine. God has told Moses that you will live. And a daddy looked up at his daughter and he said, Sweetheart, <laughs> that's the silliest thing I've ever heard in my life. Your daddy's fought everything there is to fight out here in this wilderness. I'm going to beat this snake too. You'll see. 20 minutes later, a father breathed his last breath and a daughter wept. Why? he did it his way rather than God's way. Can you see another lady? A little older now. In her early 30s, this one. She's running too, completely oblivious to the dangers around her. She's heading to her family tent, but this time it's not a dad who sits at the door. It's a little boy. Nine-year-old son. Her only son. His mama's weeping. Oh, baby. Baby, Moses has prayed for us, and God's made a way, baby. Mama, it hurts so bad. Mama, my arm is on fire. Mama, please.